start off where we left off. The judge just sentenced you to three years of state prison. Right. They have you stand up. They cuff you. What's going through your head at this time? Uh, at that point, I am feeling uh, embarrassed. And, you know, I cannot believe that I, I am in this moment and this is about to be my life. Um, I was very proud to get that badge at the academy when I graduated. Uh, it was a big um, accomplishment for me. You know, it, it, it was something that I did not foresee in my future um, of being a, a, in law enforcement. And now to be going on the other side uh, was definitely, you know, um, discouraging. When they haul you off, basically, out of the courtroom, you know, you, you, you tell everybody, you know, please take care of my kids and you do that. They take you out in cuffs. You go through that first door that leads you into the jail. Right. Um. What's that process like now as an inmate? Uh, they bring you in the back. They do your fingerprints, photo. Uh, I had to wait a little bit before they brought me down to the main level, uh, which was the county jail. Um, and, you know, it's just like you see when you're at work. You get stripped out. All your personal belongings get put in a bag. Um, and then I was hauled off to my um, wing. Um, you know, but definitely, like, you know, and my mindset was nervous. You know, I was definitely nervous. That I didn't know, you know, where I was going, what was going to happen. You know, I was just really trying to get mentally right f for anything. Um, did correction officers that work there know that you just did 17 years in a state prison as a corrections officer? Like, I, I think they... word spread pretty fast. Um, you know, I was definitely getting a lot of, like... Uh, are you good? Are you good? S shit like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, my mind was so far gone on on thinking of other things that I was just like, okay, like this, I'm not even listening. Like, mm -hmm. just get me where I need to go. So you process in, um, they put you in your cell. Like, what, what are you thinking now that you're an inmate and you were just an officer? At that point, um, like I said, very discouraging. But really, my focus is on my family. Um, my youngest son did not know where I was going. He, I, you know, we had, um, you know, told him a story about where I would be. Hopefully, for the amount of time, you know, the shortest amount of time. But my oldest son knew what was going on, and uh, I was just thinking about, you know, really, like, what's he feeling, like, yeah. you know. Uh, and things go in your things popped in my head that I was thinking of that never really I thought about about before about going through this process. Like, what if something happens to my kids? What if something happens to my family? What if something happens to me in here? I don't ever see him again. What if that's the last time I ever see any of my family again? Mm -hmm. Like, and then that just plays over in your mind constantly, and you really have to be mentally focused to keep going yeah what's the first night like in uh in county are you rethinking everything that's you know basically happened to you are you more along the lines of you know mentally preparing for what possibly could be a three-year bid yeah you're thinking about that constantly <laughs> i remember thinking like man this toilet is dirty as shit like there was like <laughs> shit on it like that thick on the sides i was like Okay, that's the first thing I got to get used to is this dirty ass <laughs> toilet. But uh, all joking aside, you know, I didn't sleep much. You know, yeah. I really didn't sleep much and um, was just again preparing myself the uh, for the unknown. You really don't know what's about to be next. Mm -hmm. How are the officers treating you, um, knowing that you were a corrections officer for 17 years. Yeah, so, some were cool. Like, most of them were cool. They were all right. They they had this little thing they were doing with me. They I was there for seven days. They did a five-man search team on my room, I think, four or five out of those seven days. I got it. I understood it, whatever. Like, you know what I mean? It, it, it didn't bother me. 
All right. So you, you, your time in county is a short stay, seven days. Um, you don't know where you're being transferred off to. But when that comes about, when they're when they basically tell you where you're going, what's that like? Like, well, where, where are you? you know, right. Who, who, who tells you? Like, how's that? How's that happen? Uh, so I was actually getting ready to like hand in my canteen form to like get like, you know, food and stuff like that and the essentials. Mm -hmm. And they were like, pack up, you're leaving. And um, I was like, okay. And, and at, you know, prior to this, I had talked to my lawyer, you know, the whole fucking the Chris Rock lady, who you know, <laughs> and uh, she had been telling me that, you know, I was most likely probably going to go down to a Southern jail Southern New Jersey, somewhere around there, because there was units for officers down there. Um, and then when I saw the two transport officers, they had this real serious look on their face. I didn't know them, but they knew who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, you know, you, you're being transferred to Trenton State, uh, which was a slap, in, like really a reality check at that point. Did you feel like the department was trying to stick it to you? At the time, I did. At the time, I definitely did. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going there. You know, I did what I did. I'm guilty of it. Um, but I'm going to Trenton State Prison. That's all I could think in my mind. You know, Trenton State Prison, in my career, had this aura about it that, you know, this is, you know, you go in there. Every A lot of guys who go in there never come back out. You know, that is their home for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, well, this is this is a setup. Like I'm getting set up right now. Why do you why why do you think that they sent you there though? Um I just I, for the scare tactic? Or I have no do, idea. Do you think it's for because you knew too many people in the department? I know? think I think that could be part of it. I think I think that I did know a lot of people and they you know they obviously weren't going to send me to the prison that i had worked yeah. um i i can't answer i really don't know the truth of that of that question because i was never told why i was sent there all i can tell you is is that i there were uh, there was 80 something of us on that unit two of them were, were ex officers that's it wow all right let's rewind a little bit because while you're in county um, and you go to get transferred out, most, if not all, inmates go to intake, the state prison. You go to intake, they process you in. You may stay a week, days, a month, a few months, and then you get shipped out to where you're going to do the rest of your bit at. Uh, for you, a little different. They ship you from Burlington County Jail straight to a cell in Trenton State Prison. Is there any reasoning behind that? I mean, like, the only thing I could think is I was on VIP status. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm going to that fucking top floor in the club. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I really didn't, you know, put any thought into it at that time. Okay. I actually didn't find out about that whole stipulation until much later in my bid when I saw parole. Um, I mean, it really didn't bother me at that at that point because I was already in my, you know, halfway through my bid. Yeah. So it really didn't make any any. Uh, it didn't be. It wasn't a big deal for me. Um, all I knew is is when I left county to go to Trenton. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to admit it. I was, I was scared. I was absolutely scared. You know what I mean? Because, again, the unknown, and I could not help but just feel so disappointed in myself because my actions had brought me to this point in my life. I didn't have to be there. I didn't have to. This didn't have to be a memory in my life or have to be a burden on my family or my children. My actions put me there. So now that now that you're in Trenton State Prison, you're there, you're in your cell. Um, I can imagine it's a mind fuck, but does anything take place 
when you get there? Uh, are officers coming up to the cell? Is anything weird going on? Because everybody <laughs> knows you're an officer, and now you're locked up at Trenton yeah. State Prison. That's kind of fucking crazy. So while I was my 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 first hour there, <laughs> while I'm in intake, um, a code goes off, and you know, officers talk as they do. You know what I mean? And uh, you know they weren't talking to me or anything, but. They were saying like, oh, we're going to get this guy moved. This guy's got to go, you know, to his housing unit. And then the other officer says, uh, it's going to be a minute. He bit this dude. He bit this guy's finger off and then he stabbed him. So it's a big medical, you know, uh, alarm as well. And I'm thinking on the first day, we're losing appendages. Like on the first day, <laughs> cannibalism right off the bat. Like, I just can't ease on into, like, a fucking, like, potential, you know, hey, I got a tummy ache or nothing. <laughs> just, hey, yo, no, I'm going to bite your fucking index finger off. And then, by the way, go ahead and stick me in the chest. That's just, probably pretty light for Trenton. And uh, I, <laughs> I definitely put fear in my heart at that point. But, you know, I did make a mental note as well in there. Like, I am not going to let these people see me how how I feel on the inside, they're not mm -hmm. going to see that on my outside. Yeah. When you get to your cell, you're in there, maybe a day, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days, whatever it is. Um, does SID contact you in any way? Well, it was weird because when I first got up there, they were telling me the whole walk up there um, you know, don't uh, let anybody know wh who you are or what you're here for. Um, I wasn't on the unit five seconds. People were screaming, calling me a, a piece of shit cop, fucking pig, all this stuff. And I had later found out that supposedly somebody had gone up there, whether it's true or not, and had said like, you know, that, you know, this net, you know, that I would be coming. Um, day two, I was told that I had an appointment I just figured that was the norm. And they brought me down into an office where there was two SID officers. And uh, all of a sudden they were my best friends and was trying to chum it up with me and asking how I was doing and how I was feeling. Where my whole mindset was like, you know, I just want to go back to my cell. Like, I don't even want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Again, my actions got me there, but mm -hmm. these fucking people are just, I mean, they're, they're the crumbs of the earth. They're straight crumbs. Yeah. And they literally slipped me their phone number and, and said, hey, listen, if, uh, if you feel unsafe or if you see anything, <laughs> make sure you give us a call. So, yeah, so, again, I'm in a maximum prison and... Your first, you you ask me if I'm safe, but then you contradict that with, if you see anything, make sure you call us. And, you know, I'm one of two cops up on this unit. The other cop has been there 20 years. And if someone, something gets snitched out, who do you think they're looking at? Yeah. So again, I, I immediately put an attitude up of, and I just kick the number back and, you know, pretty much say, go fuck yourself and take me back to my cell. I'm not beat. Yeah. Okay, so tell us, basically tell us how your entire bid goes, dude. Like, go into it, you know. Sure. Whatever you want to say. Just because I know a lot of people at this point want to know, and I know from an officer standpoint, people, whether they want to know or they don't, are very interested in, you know, go <laughs> Going from what an it's officer, like. <laughs> yeah, to an inmate, and it, you know, not for nothing. If you're an officer, you're literally a fucking sneeze away from being behind bars working right. for that oh, department, for sure. yeah. and that's the truth. Yeah, anybody can say what they want, but that's the truth. Well, for, for first, first and foremost, uh, the regulars on my unit, all three shifts, were extremely professional. Um, I did not, you know, again, I did not put any extra on them by like assuming I was uh, was supposed to get anything extra or anything like that just because I was an officer and I realized the pressure that was on these guys 
to be my officer. Like that's an extreme pressure because you know they're being watched at all times mm -hmm. um, to make sure that there's no favors, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but these guys were extremely, extremely uh, professional. Um, you know, the first stage, the first cup, the first month, you know, it's a feeling out process. Um, man, I, I, I've always been able to get along with everybody. I, I've always been able to move um, in certain situations. I had a lot of respect when I when I worked as an officer in that seg um, from from uh, convicts. And, uh, you know, I established that really quick there. Uh, I didn't have any issues. Um, went out to yard, all, you know, all these things was, you know, did trades with guys with, with canteen, all this stuff, never had a problem. Um, you know, if I had to say anything, you know, occasionally when the regulars wouldn't be up there, there'd be rookies or whatever. And, and they would like, they would come by my cell and like peek in like, oh, here's, here's that guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they would peek in and like, look at me like I was a fucking exported fucking panda from Japan. And, and you know what I mean? Like, can we feed him? Can we feed him? Put the quarter in the machine. No, he likes Cheerios. Yeah, throw it under the door. You know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, besides that, you know, no issues with officers, no issues with, with the convicts. Um, I kind of blended in. I just stayed out of the politics of it all and kind of just focused on getting my release. Yeah. So you you actually get a release date uh, for February 8th, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes. Um, so they give you that release date of the 8th. And what happens the day before? So I'm all excited. I'm getting ready to go home. Um, I've done all my J caps. There's a there's a certain things you have to do and meetings that you have to uh, go through, mm -hmm. and that lets you know that you're leaving. Um, and at four o'clock on the seventh, I got a knock on my cell door. I was parole, and they told me, "Hey, listen, you're not leaving. You're not leaving tomorrow." There's been a mistake uh, with the calculation of of when you can actually leave. Uh, and it's not the the eighth. They messed that up. Uh, your actual release date is the twenty fourth, and I really contemplated being self destructive at that point. But I knew that wasn't going to get me nowhere, and I hadn't done that the whole time I was there. You know, I was told when I first got there uh, by social services, you should put in a prison transfer. This is overkill. That social service told me that right off the bat, and I thought. No, I'm going to leave this in God's hands. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. He has a plan for me. So I'm not going to, you know, make any type of gripe about where I'm at. And it actually, like I said, it worked out. I didn't have no issues. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So um, I got the date for the 24th. And then a week later, I was told, okay, you're not leaving the 24th as well, which was a kick in the nuts. Because I was like, oh, my God, like, are they about to pull my my whole parole? Uh, but what it was, was the 24th was on a weekend. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to leave on a weekday, which the first weekday was the 26th. So I could check in with parole when I got released. Okay. So you get your release date for the 26th. Um, you walk out the door knowing you just finished doing time for a department that you gave 17 years for. Um, you can say it's corny as fuck, but blood, sweat, and tears, especially in that business. Um, like, what's your outlook on it all? I mean, I could truly say that in my 17-year career at Wagner, I gave, I gave everything. I gave my body. I gave my mind. I gave my soul to that place. I've got the scars. I got the surgeries. I've got the mental issues with it. I got substance abuse issues with it. I, I dove headfirst into that job. I, I loved that job. I really did love that job. It was everything to me. If if somebody were to watch these, um, watch the series of this interview, you said you were investigated for 31 times. You, you were investigated 31 times in SID. Correct. You know, People looking at that are going to say he was investigated 31 times and he got away with committing crimes. You know, what do you say to that? 
Well, that's not true because, and I should have probably uh, went into detail with that. Anytime that there was any type of code in AdSeg and you had to respond and force was used, there was an automatic investigation, not just with me, with whoever responded to that code. Um, so when I say I was investigated 31 times, there was other guys that were investigated that many times as well, but that was protocol from SID. You got pulled off your job, put in the main building, they investigated. Once they saw that you did not do anything wrong, they would put you back. Mm -hmm. So that was, it wasn't like a witch hunt or anything like that, I should say. I might have thought that sometimes. I'm sure there maybe was a little bit like extra mm -hmm. on me. Um, but that wasn't, you know, I wasn't out there committing crimes in the jail. That was protocol. Whenever you use force, they would pull you out, investigate the situation, make sure everything was legit. The minute that they deemed it legit, sometimes you were only pulled for like a couple of days. You know, there's an investigation sometimes would only last a couple of days and then, yeah. you, and then you would go right back. So, you know, um, I would say that, you know, definitely... Uh, this job has uh, taken its toll on me. Um, sure. I could have, you know, you you do hit a crossroads. I mean, and you can go one of two ways. Like I said before, you can go get help for your issues or you can numb your issues with yeah. substance. And that's what I did. And, you know, um, when you mix substance with ego, mm -hmm. you get chaos. Destruction. And destruction. Yeah. Self-destruction. Absolutely. And that and that was the tail end of, of my career was complete self destruction. All right. So I, I wanna end this thing on um I wanna end this thing on on something else that's going on. I want your opinion, um, maybe some advice. I have no idea, but so uh we both have um people that we know. You can call them friends or acquaintances or whatever you want to call them uh, in the department today facing basically what you're facing as a group of them and um, what do you say to those guys what do you say in you know I don't want to give any names ever you know if you're in the business you know but sure yeah what you know <clears throat> what what do you say to those guys you know, any advice or or just, you know, like what you went through or, you know, yeah. anything to help them out or like something like that. Maybe they don't give a fuck. But at the same time, you just went through this. Maybe some of them are going to go through it. Right. You know, you don't if know. I, if I had to give any advice, it would be head for the border. No. <laughs> uh, <fuck. laughs> no, I'll play. All right. I'll play. All right. All right. Um, what the advice I would give them is. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. Yep. Um, Cause you have to, I knew six months out my fate and, and kind of got a reality check and was like, okay, um, I have to get ready for this. I and, and your case from start to finish was basically like five years. Right, right. Yep. And um, you know, there's a lot that goes into that because you know, these guys have children, these guys have wives, these guys have mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters. Yeah. Um, and not only does it take a toll, not only are you going away, but your family's in there with you as well. A hundred percent. The biggest guilt I deal with to this day right now is how awesome my oldest son would make me feel when I would come home or leave in my uniform and he would write, he would draw pictures of me in my uniform with him, or he would say, tell his friends, oh, my dad's a police officer. He was a correction officer, but when they're that little, that's what they think. Yep, and he, yep. you know, he, as he got older, he, you know, he was old enough to find out what happened, you know, through the internet and all that stuff. And that is my biggest regret and biggest guilt is my actions having, a, having an effect on how he feels about me. Now, I know my son loves me. I know both my sons love me. Yeah. Um, but, he's asking me questions every day about why did I do what I did? Yeah. And that is, that is a hard pill to swallow. And, yeah. um, to, you know, to, to know that 
you know, you kind of not kind of, but you let your son, you let your kids down. You, yeah. you, you, you let your kids down by your actions being selfish. Yeah. Um, I wish I could do it all over again, but I can't. I can only try to be better today than I was yesterday. Now, like in conjunction with the guys that are going through what they're going through today and going through um, what they've been going through for the last couple of years. I mean, any type of advice for them or like... <sighs> You know, because I, I, I don't know exactly what they're going through, but I know. Right. Well, know. the only thing I can say is um, nothing's going to prepare you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nothing's going to prepare you. Everyone's journey's different. Mm -hmm. Someone might have a different journey than me. You know what I mean? I had a different journey than other CEOs that have been in there. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I know I'll be praying for them. You yeah. know what I mean? I'll yeah. be praying and, and, and hoping that the best outcome happens. Um, Some of those guys are pretty close. I know a lot of those guys. And yeah. a lot of those guys, in my opinion, don't deserve to be going through any of this. Yeah. I would say Perhaps. all of them just about. Yeah. Um, I love a lot of those guys to death. A lot of those guys are top-notch officers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't want to criticize the upper echelon of the department. Mm -hmm. Um but it does seem in the past couple of years that the rate of officers being indicted um, over everything. But no supervisors being indicted? I mean, I, I mean, no, there are supervisors. I'm just saying it's, it it's seems to, it, it's to, very rare. It's my opinion that that it has. The gears have shifted of what can we find on these officers? Let's 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 find something so we can go after them and I don't give a shit if that makes me look like I'm a bad guy or or like I'm trying to stick up for dirty cops because this isn't about dirty cops the situation that we're talking about right now is not about dirty cops yeah all like those, I said before, all those guys that are in that situation today are good guys every single one so of them. and not even about being good guys the incident that they're in is is about a use of force incident yeah um and I'm sorry but the public needs to know, as a correction officer, we're not working in a fucking daycare. Yeah. You're not dealing with uh, individuals that make rash decisions. Yeah. You are dealing with the worst of the worst that the state has to offer. Yeah. And I'm sorry, you just can't be all fucking unicorns and rainbows in there. Yeah, facts. Um, and sometimes it takes force. Now, force means po following the policy and procedure of that force. Yeah. Like I said, I'm guilty of what I did. Okay? I'm guilty of what I did. Mm -hmm. I struck a cuffed inmate uh for attempt for threatening to spit at me. That's against policy and procedure. I took full ownership of it. Did your time and did my time. Um we're not talking about officers bringing in cell phones, drugs, shit like that which go ahead, give them yeah, give it to them. I don't give a fuck about those people. Yeah. Um, I, I feel for these guys. I really do. And I feel like the department has lost sight on what are good cops and what are bad cops. Yeah. Uh, th again, my opinion. It doesn't mean that it's right or, right or wrong. It's yeah. just my opinion. All right. Well, part three of a four-part series. That yeah. was great, Bird. Uh, thanks for getting into that four part. I'm calling everybody out. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for um, just diving into your time in sure. Trenton State Prison as you know, you 17 years as a correction officer and you know, getting a three year bid, doing nine months in Trenton State Prison. You know, it's very humbling for you to come on here and tell your story. Honestly, I'm your brother. It, 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 I'm asking the questions. I've been in the department. I spent almost 10 years in there with you. And uh, it's very humbling um, for you to tell your story, especially it's, in front of me, dude. Yeah, it's therapeutic for me as well. It, it helps me deal with issues, uh, you know, some issues of, you know, being in there and now that I'm out and free. Sure. Uh, so it, help, it helps that I get to talk about it. Absolutely. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody's, you know, 
happy that you're telling your story. <laughs> Some may not, but I, you know, our our, our guys. I'm only are telling happy. the truth. That's it. You know what I mean, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. You know, build something up that it isn't. Absolutely. You know? So thank you, and um, part four coming soon. Yep. Can't yeah. wait. Thanks, brother. All right. Thank you.